direct from the web, it's Billy Masters Live. And now, please welcome your host, Billy Masters. Okay, here we go. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Billy Masters Live. I am Billy Masters, of course. And today is Tuesday, June 16th, 2020. I have lost track of how many days in quarantine we are at this point. But it's a long time. A good thing, at least uh, depending on where you are, um, you can get out. You can get some air. Hopefully you're wearing masks when you're around other people. We will be getting to that later. Uh, we have a really exciting show today, but just uh, an update on our so, uh, upcoming shows. On Thursday, we have Tony Award winner Levi Kreiss, who is here, and uh, some other special guests. So be sure to turn in. Did I say Tuesday? Thursday. It's Thursday. I don't know what day it is. Um, also, if you are watching on Facebook, great. Watch it. I've given up trying to get you people to switch to YouTube, but... If you go to YouTube, the reception on the live feed is much better. And if you are on, so I'll give you a second. Go just click to YouTube. It's in the link. Um, and if you're on YouTube, there's a little button right there. That's my logo and says subscribe. Subscribe. It helps us. It doesn't cost you anything. It only takes a second. Um, and we have a... Uh, Somebody who's already jumped in helping us with our social media presence because you know, I'm exhausted. I'm very busy. So if there are social media gurus who know what they're doing and uh, want to chip in, please contact me at Billy at BillyMasters.com. So here we are in the middle of L.A. or Gay Pride Month. I say L.A. because I've been in L.A. for the past 22 years. But right now I'm in Boston. It's also Pride Week here in Boston. But we are in Pride Month. And um, I want to spotlight somebody who, you know, we have a very short attention span. And we forget things even in our recent history. Um, back in 1994, comedian Bob Smith openly gay comedian Bob Smith was the first openly gay comedian to appear on The Tonight Show. 1994 to me seems so recently, and yet it is so long ago. Um, and there have not been many openly gay comedians since uh, on The Tonight Show or anywhere else. So um, Bob Smith in 1994, The Tonight Show, the same year he had, he was the first openly gay comedian to have an HBO special, which is why he was on The Tonight Show to promote that special. Um, it was not much long, well, a little longer. 2007, he went public that he had ALS. And um, he died in 2018. And up until the day he died, his mind was still completely active. He was as quick and witty as ever. We corresponded all of the time. It was just, what, the way he described it to me was being trapped inside of his body. And for somebody who was so uh, bright and articulate and a performer, that was torture. The good side of it was that he was also a brilliant writer. There are many books out there by Bob Smith. So I would encourage you to check them out. And even while he wasn't able to perform, he was still able to write and wrote some really great books. Uh, uh, what is the book called? Time or Things of Re Remembrances of Things Past, I believe is the name of the book. Great book. I really enjoyed it a lot. And uh, two years before he died, he had written, I believe, his last book. And there was a book reading. And he was not able to read because of his disease. And a lot of his friends were there to perform. And at the after party, we saw each other for the last time. And there we are. And um, he was somebody who was very close to me. He was a role model to me. He came before me in many ways. Uh he, with Funny Gay Males, which began in 1988, paved the way for openly gay performers everywhere. Interestingly enough, um, he was not necessarily the funniest. I mean, the good thing about a group of three people is you have somebody who is in every category. Jaffe Cohen, the most stereotypically gay 
of the group. Danny McWilliams, probably the funniest all around. Uh, and then later, Eddie Singletary was also filled, uh, filled that slot. Bob Smith was very much the everyman. He wasn't threatening as a gay man. He wasn't overly attractive to make the gay men like, oh, I don't want to laugh at him because he's too cute. And he wasn't unattractive. He was every man. And so many times in our community, it's the ones that are the least threatening and the ones most accessible that um, break through and lead the way for so many of us. And that kind of uh, is an introduction for my first guest. Uh, I became aware of Thomas Roberts years ago. I have followed his career through so many really interesting and varied uh, incarnations. And his most recent is he's doing a, uh, like this show, an online show. And here is a clip for, I believe, tomorrow's show, if I'm not mistaken, with Kathy Griffin. Take a look at this. Honey, don't even start with me, because I go back to LA Gay Pride when the streets were still open, when some of the guys would dress up as Dupar's waitresses. Um, <laughs> then there were the guys that dressed up as cheerleaders. They would actually, what's funny is watching, well, funny, because you got to look for comedy to everything, is watching the news of how um, protesters are like closing down streets. Yeah. I'm like, oh girl, the gays have been doing that for Pride Fest every year. Are you kidding? <laughs> See, thank God he wrote it at the end, Wednesday, Kathy Griffin, at 5 p.m. Eastern. However, you don't have to wait till Wednesday because we have Thomas Roberts here with us today. Hello, Thomas. Hey, Billy. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. And I, and I appreciate the plug, too, for tomorrow. Oh, it's going to be a please. great episode with Kathy. And is it on every day, every weekday? When is it on? No. So uh, it's on Mondays. Wednesdays and Fridays at five o'clock and we're using Facebook live as the platform. Uh, so there's a special fan page, uh, Thomas Roberts live. And if you go to that page itself, then you'll be able to find the show. Uh, so, you know, got to jump through a little bit of hoops, but yeah, uh, I know it's be there exactly at five o'clock. Uh, <laughs> you can jump in in progress. And then also we have our YouTube page at, Gay Good News, and you can find the full show there afterwards. And so, well, first off, I appreciate you being Monday, Wednesday, and Friday since I'm Tuesday, Thursday, but we're at different times. <laughs> so, you know, it, it was it, when I started doing this, it was really in response to the pandemic. And I was kind of shamed into it because people were sitting home, they were binging shows, they needed entertainment, they needed something to watch and something to laugh at for an hour. And so I was happy to do that. What got you started in this? I needed something to do. <laughs> I'm bored as hell. Uh, you know, so the, uh, you know, I, when I left MSNBC and NBC News in the spring of 2018, I accepted a job here in Atlanta uh, with the CBS affiliate uh, to be their main anchor. Uh, I, I was there 14 months and the job just wasn't the right fit. So uh, I left in September of 2019 and I thought I'll just take you know the rest of the year off because it's going to be the holidays soon and nobody's hiring at that time of year. Uh, and I told my agents to start looking at the beginning of 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, so they got a little professional traction when we got off the ground in 2020 and then COVID hit. Right. Um, and so it's a whole new world. And I was approached by somebody, uh, you know, that kind of popped this idea into my head uh, to do something for June Pride. And I just loved it. And so I picked it up and kind of ran with the ball. And the only the only reason why I can't do it every day is there's just not enough of me. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know, I started in broadcasting as a one man band. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. where you're, you know, the cameraman, you're the reporter, you're the editor. Uh, and that's what I am for this show. I'm pretty much doing it all on my own. Uh, so, it and it's exhausting. Oh, yeah. I don't. I don't think people realize. I mean, they say, "Oh, Billy's on," you know, two hours a week, three hours a week, and they don't know the the prep that goes into it, the booking of guests, the editing of clips, um, yeah. and just uh, just doing the show. It's really it, tiring. It's, I mean, it is great. I mean, I really, I really love it, and I think that uh, it gives me a uh, you know, I've always had a great appreciation for colleagues on show teams because I did start out as a one man band. And so, you know what it's like to be an editor and the pressures you face, and you know what it's like to be the cameraman for the, 
you know, the, the skill set necessary and the pressures you face. Uh, so this just makes me uh, all the more appreciative for all the colleagues that I've had the uh, fortunate opportunity to work with in the past because, yeah, it's, it, it takes a team to do this. And uh, especially if you want to do it right and you want to do it well. Uh, so I put all this internal pressure on myself. Right. Uh, to make sure that it can be good. And plus, I suck at the technology of it all. I mean, <laughs> I've had some brutal, you know, Facebook lives where I'm just lost as a puppy uh, trying to figure out how to make it all work. Uh, but that's, and your husband has helped you. I was going to say, my, I'm very lucky that I, that I have uh, my husband, Patrick, who uh, will watch. And especially it was last week, I guess, on Wednesday. And boy, mm -hmm. I was thinking, I mean, it was bad. Uh, and it's, you know, you're like a duck because you want to look all cool on the surface and like under the water, your little feet are like, oh, like this is crazy. Uh, so Patrick came running in as he was watching to help me out. And uh, I think people enjoyed it anyway. And it uh, was nice to know that somebody here is going to help me out. And Patrick's <laughs> much smarter with technology than I am. <laughs> Has it been like a big learning curve because... I think that by doing this live, you really do expose yourself, but you also have to learn because you've said, yeah. all right, it's on at this time and we'll figure it out. Right. I want to, I want to be a man of my word. I want to uh, follow through on you know, the commitment that I've, I've made to this. And it, so in my head, Billy, like, you know, I can map it all out. I can map a rundown. I can see it all uh, in my head. It's just kind of like translating it through this new medium uh, and making sure that it's being, uh, you know, the, the process is being delivered. So uh, typically, you know, in a studio, uh, you know, you've got a whole production, uh, you know, team behind you, a control room behind you, uh, that's helping you out and making you look good. And telling so, you what to do. Well, yeah. And in many cases, especially, you know, if, if, uh, if something's not working, uh, because they've had a chance to preview it in terms of a clip or a graphic that you're trying to put up, you're just not going to go to it. Instead of me thinking, you know, uh, I'm going to hit that and it's going to be there and then it's not there. <laughs> <laughs> you, know? you know, that's when you get those moments of like, oh gosh, I guess I'll tell a joke, you know. It, well, I, uh, I have been in the same situation, obviously. And um, what I think is interesting, and, and I don't know if you do it, I find it very difficult to go back and look at the live shows first, because all I see is the things that I wish were better. It doesn't necessarily match what I had in my head, but secondly, because it's gone out there, it's live. There is nothing right. I can do about it. And I think if I start watching it, too much, I, I equate it to actors on sets that they shouldn't see the dailies because they just have to trust that what they're doing is right. Because if you become too self-conscious, the authenticity is gone. Yeah. And so, I mean, live, you know, I've always thought of it. It's feathers to the wind. You know, you can't get it back. Uh, and so you try to, uh, you know, keep your calm and do everything that you feel like you've been trained to do, or at least I feel like I've been trained to do all, all these years later, uh, to, to try and make it look uh, effortless and somewhat professional. Uh, but on the back end, luckily, so there is a producer that I'm working with, uh, and she's oh, an old right. friend that I, I grew up with in Baltimore, uh, who I'd worked in local news for many years and has a producer mindset uh, like I do, and we speak the same lingo. And so she helps me uh, get the YouTube version of the show looking a little better. So oh, good. when we are live, we're you know live at five. And then uh, for what we put up on uh, the YouTube channel, uh, that's a little tweaked and, uh, you know, uh, cleaned up with graphics added and, you know, some mm -hmm. funny bits. I mean, she had a great time. Uh, her name is Jennifer Kane and she's fabulous. Uh, but she had a good time with the show from last week on Wednesday, uh, you know, playing around with all, all my fumbles and all my mess ups, uh, you know, trying to make it a little more humorous than it already was. So uh, in that respect, uh, there is a little bit, a little bit of control on the back end to, uh, you know, help enhance things and make it look a little smoother. Are you happy with how it looks? Are you able to look at it and say, that's okay, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I don't, I re I've gotten used to looking at air checks or, you know, looking mm -hmm. at myself or hearing my own voice. 
so that part doesn't bother me but it is but there is uh there is you know i take issue with myself if i say uh or um or i'm not mm -hmm. being clear enough because there's no teleprompter i don't write scripts i just want to you know talk with everybody as i normally would trying to tell a story to a friend um right so i try and you know i try not to take those pause moments but it's human i do it you know, that's what yeah, I, that's I, I kick myself over i was uh telling somebody just before the show that when uh, you know when i started this and it was just as i said to just jump in and you know entertain people then i started getting the criticism oh could you make the bed or i just had surgery on my shoulder oh i know you've only got one arm but could you fix your hair and i'm like <laughs> no that's not what i'm trying to do and as the show wait now i'm looking at your shot where's the bed Oh yeah, well, I got a green screen because I was okay. tired of hearing it. <laughs> because I'm not gonna make the bed, Thomas. Robert. I don't care who's watching. Well, and also I uh, I am back at my parents' house because I'm in LA usually, but I came back here to have rotator cuff surgery on my left shoulder Ooh. the day before they shut down non-essential surgeries. Oh, so wow. I had already been planning on being here for a month just recuperating and right. then you know, it turned into a fortunate thing. I have older parents. I'm glad I was here even with one arm. But suddenly my childhood room has turned into a studio and nobody understands what I'm doing up here. I think that's awesome. Uh, yeah, you, well, you need to give us a behind the scenes tour sometime. Have you done that yet? No, I have not. Okay. I am not passing the pony in my basement. No, I but want I, a behind the scenes oh, tour. I want to see yeah. this because I think it's fantastic. It's like, you know, uh, who would have thought if you, if you had gone back, you know, to, uh, you know, your childhood and tell yourself you're going to be doing a TV show or, you know, you're going to have a show in your bedroom in years to come. You probably thought that person was crazy. Yeah. And the funny thing is I've been able to talk to people that, uh, you know, when it started, I was able to call friends. I was just going through the Rolodex and calling people. And then I was able to reach out to heroes of mine and people I have looked up to and really ask questions that, I wanted to ask knowing that there was somebody else at home thinking I want to ask that question. And, you know, you and I are both fortunate to be able to do that and have access to people that not everyone has access to. Yes. Uh, I, I mean, I feel uh, really lucky uh, that people have actually responded to me that I've reached out to because, <laughs> uh, you know, I feel like, the time I had, whether it was at CNN or at MSNBC or, or even briefly at Entertainment Tonight and The Insider, you know, you make genuine connections with people uh, and, you know, years can go by and, and then you, you know, pop up on their radar again. And most everybody has been very nice and very gracious uh, about wanting to come on and, and, and wanting to be a part of, of my new project. So I feel very fortunate uh, with that. Very fortunate. You've also had, you have had, we're going to get into the career, you've had a really diverse career. And I know that because you and I have kind of known each other online. We've n I don't think we've ever met in person. We may No, have. I don't think we've had a chance to, no. No, but we've known each other for years. We've, uh -huh. we've, we've emailed and reached out to each other. And I have watched you kind of go all over the globe. I remember the very brief time at The Insider that I thought was the strangest job. And I had reached out to you and you said, yeah, I'm kind of thinking so too. That didn't last very long. No, it didn't. Uh, so I was there six months and then I wow. got to Evo, uh, which totally took me by surprise. Uh, we had um, been in Atlanta for almost six years Mm -hmm. uh, so Patrick and I got here to Atlanta in 2002, just at, just right at the beginning. It was right after September 11th. And, wow. Uh, bought a house and, and we were here. It was during that time that I was at CNN that I came out. And then Patrick got this great opportunity for his company to move to D.C. And I wanted to go along. And I was in the final year. So I had two three-year contracts at CNN and I was in the final year of the second one. And I, I went to the bosses and asked them, could I go work out of uh, DC uh, so I could be with my husband, uh, you know, to be with my partner. It wasn't my husband then, but to be with my partner. And they said, no, we really, you know, we can't use you in that capacity there. Uh, so we just agreed to part ways early because I didn't wow. want to be stuck here in Atlanta. And 
you know, after I, after I came out, I was kind of, my position kind of got demoted anyway. So it was just an easier way to, to part company. Uh, but I wanted to be in DC and then my agent came to me with this LA job. And by that point I had been out of work for almost four months and was going crazy. So I thought, okay, well, you know, I'll, I'll go for it. And then, uh, went for it. Patrick got transferred, you know, to LA and as right. as about as he was about to move out in February of 2008. Mm. Um, and I'd already been there since August of 2007, like a week before he was supposed to move out, I got fired. And he was, he was at the time living uh, with my mother in Baltimore because his territory was Baltimore and DC. And so he gave up his DC condo because he was moving to LA and had this time with my mom. So I had to call my mother's house. <laughs> they were watching American Idol and they used to have, they, they get along so well. They would have like filet and drink wine and watch American Idol. And so I want to hang up with them. Yeah, I had to call and, and tell him, you know, can you leave the room with my mother really fast? I got something to tell you. Um, so, but we stayed in LA uh, and uh, Patrick moved forward with his job and uh, we were in LA for about three years. Yeah. And so the the insider job, aside from being fired, I remember talking to you during it and it it seemed to me from what you were saying that you weren't particularly comfortable with the tabloidish format of the show is am i remembering that right yeah it was it was tough for me because i was coming into it from um, you know i spent my 20s uh in local news coming up you know as i said said before as a one man band and then in you know local newsrooms around the country doing hard news and then i ended up at cnn at 29 and that was you know all hard news. I'd never really jumped into a strictly entertainment based uh, program before. Right. But I, I, I mean, I'm, uh, you know, a, a savant when it comes to pop culture knowledge and I, I loved those shows. So I thought, why not, you know, give it a try. Uh, and it was a learning experience for sure. I mean, those are some hardworking people on those shows, hardworking people. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I, I learned a lot, but I, it wasn't right for me because, uh, I don't know, well, the, the Malibu fires. So, for mm -hmm. example, uh, when the Malibu fires were happening in 2007, 2008, uh, they closed down the Malibu Farmers Market. What is it called? Like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? The farmers. Yep. The Anyway, it's like right there by the ocean. And uh, the Starbucks coffee was closed and... Uh, the producers wanted me to say and, you know, go up to the closed doors and say, and, 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 and Brittany can't come down here and get her triple chai latte, no foam, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, but do we know she came here today? And they're like, no, we'll find that out later. Uh, we'll just have that in the bag, you know, as in, in case. And I, so I was like, I don't want to do that. You know, I don't right. want to, I don't want to do that. And they're like, well, we'll call back to, you know, home base and tell them you're not doing it. I'm like, ah. Great. All right, I'll do it. You know, so it was little things like that that uh, didn't work out for me. Plus, they wanted me to go back in the closet. That was another big one. Yeah. Now that you know, talking about coming out, you came out. I, I my recollection is you came out when you were on CNN. Is that true? Yes. So uh, uh, I was uh, on Headline News on CNN Headline News and. Uh, oh, Long, long lost HLN. I enjoyed them. Well, and, and we had primetime hours of news coverage. Yeah. That I was doing. Great. And uh, so I was uh, invited to go to NLGJA, which is the National Lesbian and Gay Journalism Association's conference that year. It was being held in Miami. This was 2006, September of mm -hmm. 2006. And they asked me to sit on a panel called Out in the Newsroom. And everyone at work, you know, knew about my relationship and knew about Patrick. And obviously somebody, you know, an LGGA knew about it and they asked me to sit on this you know, panel. Uh, so I went and I sat on the panel. I didn't think, you know, much of it, but, you know, it was all journalists who, and some wrote about it and said that, you know, I had officially come out, uh, which I guess I did. I mean, I wasn't, uh, you know, upset about being on the panel. I wanted to be on the panel. Uh, and, 
So there was coverage of me coming out. Uh, and when I got back to CNN that Monday, this was over a weekend, I was called into a meeting and, and told that my hours were changing. Uh, wow. That's yeah. quick. Yeah. So that was then, you know, and that was 2006. Uh, what did your hour, what were your hours before? Like, what was the shift? Was it like to a middle of the night shift, a morning shift? What was it? So the, the shift I had been on was the Monday through Friday, like the primetime hours. I think it was 6 to 9 p.m. And then I was uh, told I'd be moved to overnights and weekends. So that is a big change. It's not even a little shift. That's a let's hide him when no one's watching. Well, you know, they had good, they had some good numbers overnight. <laughs> you know, with, uh, with the shut ins and stuff. Uh, but uh, well, that's when I watch. So, <laughs> well, I'm, I mean, you know, there are different time zones and things like that, but it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't good for my life. It, it wasn't something that was going to be promoted. It wasn't, you know, what they considered prime time or uh, the hours that they go after for advertisers. Um, this was going to be a big change. Uh, and also, you were how old at this time? Late twenties? Uh, no, so I was thirty three, thirty four. But you're you know, you're in your prime time, and as a newscaster, you're on the trajectory at that point. And that yeah, well, the I, so in joining there, that was in the the um, you know the second contract that I had with them, and in the final year of that second contract. So the only thing that happened to me along the way then was that I, I came in the door and I, uh, you know, came in slowly and kept advancing, you know, within, right. within the building to do more, to have, uh, uh, to be trusted more, um, to grow as a journalist and as a broadcaster. So that was just like a big change. Was yeah. the goal ever to, Host to go to a the network and b network primetime news was that like I would think for a newsman that's what you strive for. My, so my goal was always to get to today. I always wanted to be on the Today Show. So oh, that okay. was, wow! That was the big dream for me. Even then, um, you know, to to someday that's that's you know like the what I had envisioned uh, for myself was getting to the Today Show. Um, was it the hours? Was it the diversity? Was it the length of the broadcast? What was it? For the Today Show? Yeah. Uh, I think it was just, it's, it, it kind of did it all, you know, because <laughs> you could do hard news and you could do politics and you could do breaking and it just kind of, it, it, it touched everything that I, that I liked, that I enjoyed doing. Sure. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, kind of the, the dream job. It was like the, you know, the, the TV dinner of everything because you get the meat, the potatoes, you know, you get your dessert, uh, you get it all. So and you can do long form when you need to. There is time. Right. Yeah. Um, plus, I think that growing up watching that show, there was just a you know magic to it um, that that I dreamt of wanting to be a part of. But you ended up at the the network at NBC and right, and yeah. Like, well, you actually were on the Today Show because I found a clip with you and Matt Lauer. So you were there. Were you just a yeah. contributor there? What were you with the Today Show? So uh, when I joined MSNBC in 2010, uh, that's another, I came in, you know, it was a slow roll, you know, getting in the door and uh, advancing along, being trusted with responsibility and, and people, um, you know, liking me behind the desk or, or you know, liking what I was, what I was doing. Um, so when you're in the building, you know, at 30 Rock, there is an opportunity to kind of volunteer, or, you know, throw yourself uh, in the faces of other executive producers to say, I can help out. Uh, let me know if you ever need anything. And also to get in the rotation for fill it anchoring. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got on the radar uh, to begin with was to uh, be on the news desk. And this is when the show format still had two at the desk and you had kind of the, you know, the Ann Curry uh, news set. Um, right. And so that's what I did uh, when I first got to fill in on the Today Show. I think it was filling in on a weekend today at the news desk mm -hmm. uh, 
and then being in the, you know being in the building for years to come and having an opportunity to fill in uh for lester because lester was still uh the weekend today co-host and he had uh both the today show and then nightly news on saturdays and sundays so we had very long saturdays and very long sundays mm -hmm. uh, but so filling in for lester um and then yes being a, a reporter uh weekday for the today show which i did uh a lot more of in my my final year when I was with NBC and MSNBC. And then you made history. Uh, and it was, was it a Saturday night? It was a Saturday night. That yeah. was my recollection. Cause, because I write a column that comes out every Monday morning. And so usually Saturday and Sunday, I am writing the column. And I remember vividly Sunday morning getting the latest draft back from my proofer saying, are you going to write about Thomas Roberts? And I said, what am I writing about? And that <laughs> clip went everywhere that day. It was huge news that uh, the first open, and I have to say openly gay, because I'm sure gay men had anchored the news. I mean, we're not so sure about Stone Phillips, but somebody was gay. But you were openly gay at that point, And all of a sudden, without announcement, you popped up on the evening news. Right. So, uh I was asked to, to fill in. Uh, this is when Lester moved over to take over nightly full time Monday through Friday. It created, uh, you know, opportunities for a lot of fill in anchoring for the uh, weekend today show and for nightly news on Saturday and Sunday. And so I had been asked to do nightly on, uh, gosh, I can't remember what Saturday it was, um, but I think it was in 2015. It was 2015 yeah. in August. Okay. The day, uh, the fifth or something. And so I, I was asked to, to fill in and yeah, got, got to make history as the first openly gay man to anchor an evening news broadcast. How much notice did you have before the broadcast? When were you asked? Oh gosh. Um, you know, probably within a work week. I mean, oh, okay. You know, so you knew it wasn't like an, you know, an emergency, right. Uh, you know, the person we had had a heart attack. <laughs> you know, there goes Thomas Graham. It wasn't anything like that. Uh, we had, yeah, I had, had advance uh, notice on that. Um, Did you know the historical impact it would have at that point going into it? No, not, not, I mean, I, no, not, not at first. Um, but then I kind of realized it and thinking about it. Yes. Yeah. Um, there is, uh, first, uh, this is you on that day. I always note the uh, the suit jacket. Oh, I love that suit. Yes, oh, I do too. And, I love uh, that suit. Suit supply, best place to get suits if you're ever in need of a suit. Suit supply. <laughs> oh, okay. See, we may we'll get them as a sponsor. And um, let me show just a little clip. There is a, a a brief clip of you opening it, but this is part of a longer clip of some other stories that you covered. And so let's show this and then we'll bring Steve Kometko on as well. So let's roll the clip. Nightly news begins now. Breaking news tonight, monster holiday storm. States of emergency as Hermine batters the Southeast. Pushback is coming fast and furious tonight against the Obama administration's historic new directive to the nation's public school. Joining me now, Democratic Congresswoman from Alabama, Terry Sewell. Representative, good to have you here. And your governor uh, wanted to just put this out there, what he had to say uh, after he gave the order to take that flag down. Democratic Congresswoman in Alabama's 7th District, Terry Sewell. Safe travels to South Carolina tomorrow, and thanks for your time today. What I find fascinating about that clip is that you've, even five years ago, you were talking about things that are just as relevant today. True. And uh, as going through your clip reel, that's what I found. And we are joined right now by Steve Kometko. Steve, Hello. thank you for joining us. Hi, Steve. Hi, Thomas. We've never met. It's I like know, I know. I was so excited about this. Our I mean, like a a close, but we've never crossed paths. And well, uh, I'm a great admirer. Oh, uh, please. Thank you very much. I feel like I'm looking at an eight by ten glossy. Oh, my <laughs> you know, at least you guys had those glossy years. So no reason for Kometko to complain. Hey, but hey, hey. I should mention that um when I had Steve on, I 
think like my second show or third show was right at the beginning. Thomas was supposed to join us then because I thought that having really three sort of eras that we comprise, we may have very different experiences. And yet, the more I research, the more I realize maybe our experiences are exactly the same. So um, I want to, you know, let's start with what's going on right now and talk about the Confederate flag issue, which Thomas, you brought up in 2015. It's been talked about for years and years and years and really generations. Is something different happening now? What do you think? Uh, I'd, I'd hope to think so. I mean, I, it's, it's past its, past its day uh, and needs to be in a museum, and that's about it. Uh, I think most people would agree that uh, that is a symbol uh, of something that we should not be proud of. And there's no reason uh, to uh, fly it in front of your home or put it on your mud flaps or put it on your car in some way. I mean, it's just uh, not something that Tells, tells the right story about, I think, what we want to be known as, uh, as the greatest you know, country on, on the planet. Uh, it's, it's part of a, a dark stain that while we should never forget about it, uh, we shouldn't do things to highlight it. Steve, now you come from uh, news, but also an entertainment background. So let's talk about Gone with the Wind, which while, and again, where we we're probably well, you weren't there, but while while we are probably the wrong people to be asking because the three of us are Caucasian men, we're not men of color and we're not women of color. Um, but I guess maybe I am in a, a weird category because I've always looked at it as a grand, sweeping, epic love story, and I never see the racial overtones, which obviously are there. So Steve, have you been hearing this argument about Gone with the Wind over the years that you've been working in entertainment? Uh, I don't know if I've heard, heard it over the years. Um, <laughs> I used to work with a guy who would say, hey, Steve, do you still have the tapes from the Gone with the Wind junket? <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, I don't. Um, but uh, I don't know how I feel about the whole thing. I know that the last time I watched the movie, which is a number of years ago now, I know it gave me a giant ick attack because it was so, uh, there were so many racist elements to it. But then, you know, I'm of the, the opinion that you have to look at it as a, a moment in time. That's, that's what they were portraying. And um, Hollywood in 1939 was a much different place than it is today. Uh, and I don't know if you can um, look at it through today's lens or filter. Um, you know, I can remember I went to the 50th anniversary screening of Gone with the Wind um, at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a lot of fun. I remember having a great time. The, some of the people came in costume. There was a woman sitting next to me who had a big hoop skirt. <laughs> she sat down and have to push the hoop skirt away. And uh, Butterfly McQueen was there who played Christy. Uh, right. as Anne Rutherford, who was one of uh, Scarlett's sisters. And it was great fun. And, and there was no talk at that time about uh, the racist element. But there's no denying it, you know, when you look at it today. Um, sure. So I think, you know, I think it's a good idea that they take it out of circulation for a while and put together a little something that uh, explains the time before they, before they uh, air it again. You know, you know uh, it's, it's interesting where, where this ends because if you look at books if you look at pieces of art if you look at various people in history including presidents there are ick moments attached to all of them and my feeling has always been that i would like to think and maybe i give people too much credit that nobody is watching gone with the wind as a documentary <laughs> i don't think anybody is looking at the ten commandments thinking boy those hebrews loved building pyramids it's it is part of history and hopefully we learn from it, but maybe it is being glamorized in a way that people cannot separate. Thomas, do you think that's true? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, like Steve is saying, if you if you look at that movie and and think of today, and uh, yeah, you, the, the ick moments are are definitely going to be there, and I I think it calls into question just how we're wired today, you know, how our brains are wired today uh, to be able to contextualize. Uh, what a movie like that meant in 1939 to come out and be so successful. What does it mean now and in 2020? And and you know, who does it you know who does it touch? Who does it hurt uh, when we think about uh, just a, a rerun of that, say on TBS or something like that, uh, where Gone with the Wind comes on? Uh, there are sensitivities that many of us are now being. Uh, drawn into where we're, where we're being uh, put into those moments of trying to imagine what it's like to be in that person, that other person's shoes. And, you know, the only way that we're going to be able to deal with the issue of systemic racism in the country is for white people to call out other white people. Um, exactly. You know, it, it's, it's, it's not going to be, uh, even though we had a, a black president for eight years uh, and they attempted to uh, put into place different policies to affect change here. Uh, you know, we need to plant some seeds uh, that are going to grow for a very long time. You know, that, that it, it will be generational. Uh, but we need to have people, uh, not just, you know, white people taking care of white people and, and confronting them on racism, but we need to have elected leaders that are people of color that can take into those positions of power uh, the knowledge that they have and that they have from their own communities to help uh, seed what what areas uh, need the right growth. And, and that way, uh, we also need to guard against whoever comes after that person from diminishing uh, whatever was planted. Because I think that's what we've also seen after having a black president for eight years, an administration that came in uh, with a steel baseball bat trying to uh, take away everything that the prior administration had accomplished. So uh, it's not just one quick, you know, there's no one quick fix to this. Yeah, I, uh, I also, since we're in this time where, again, we have a pandemic, so people are home, they're not living their regular lives, so they have more time to think and to act. We have... Um, an election coming up. We have black people being shot by policemen. There's a lot, there's a lot. It's almost like a perfect storm. And uh, in Boston this past weekend, a statue of Christopher Columbus was beheaded. And it, it that really hit home for me because I thought, where does that end? You know, we've heard about Confederate uh, uh, generals, statues wanting to be brought down. And I said, well, now you've got Christopher Columbus. You're going to have Thomas Jefferson. It seems to me that there has to be a way of dealing with things rather than reacting to things. But perhaps reacting is the only way to deal with them. Thomas, what do you think? Uh, you know, I think that, you know, we have museums for a reason. And we need to put a lot more stuff in those museums. Uh, you know, I, I think it was Bill Barr who was talking recently about it's the winners who get to write history. Uh, and, you know, we've had for a very long time uh, people that have gotten to write their own history uh, and be remembered for a history that uh, doesn't really uh, comport to reality. Uh, and to the reality of some atrocities that happened during their times in leadership. Uh, and that all has to be taken into, you know, I think that has to all be taken into account. Um, and who do we want to be from this day forward? Uh, you know, collectively, you know, as a, as a country, but what is our social contract with one another? I think the social contract that we've had, uh, as demonstrated by recent news events, uh, is broken, and mm -hmm. we need to take a really hard look at at what it's going to take to repair that, and and that is going to be uh, work that is that everybody, you know, not not just people in D.C. and, and legislatively, but that all of us have to want to be a part of. 
Steve, we're in the middle of Gay Pride Month uh, at the same time as all this is going on. Now, you heard what Thomas was talking about, his trajectory in the newsroom and in the career of being, you know, openly gay amongst his colleagues versus openly gay on the air. And I know we talked about this as well, that you had always been, for the most part, pretty openly gay with people you worked with. Was there the possibility of being as open as Thomas was during your time, say, at E? Uh, oh, yes. E was uh, a very comfortable setting for me. Um, but I'll tell you, back in 1980, when I worked for the NBC affiliate in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I was about to be promoted to the weeknight anchor, I'd been shown the, um, the schedule and everything by the newsroom secretary. Uh, the week before it was supposed to happen, uh, I got called up to the general manager's office because somebody told him that I was gay. And that was the end of that. He said to me after a long conversation, you might as well start looking for a job somewhere else because you're not going any further here. And, uh, and, and I went off to Louisville, Kentucky, but it scared the hell out of me. Uh, I had talked to my brother. Uh, I called him and said, what am I going to do? Uh, because my brother is gay as well. I'm very fortunate in having an older gay brother. Wow. I didn't know that. Yes, and he said, uh, just be honest. That's all you can do, just be honest with him. And I was. And he asked me questions that he had no right to ask, like, you know, do you show affection to your partner in front of your parents? Uh, do you ever, you know, are you going to be marching in the gay pride parade? And uh, it was just uh, very humiliating. And um, everything worked out okay for the most part. I ended up in Los Angeles eventually and working for E, which was my dream job. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I, I'm thrilled to turn on the TV today uh, and on MSNBC, for example, and see uh, Steve Kornacki, who's openly gay, and, and um, Rachel Maddow. I mean, is there anybody out there who doesn't know that Rachel's a big old lesbian? <laughs> you know? And I say that with, yeah. with the kindest, you know, uh, regards. Uh, and she's probably the most, one of the most respected journalists working today. Rachel. And uh, Seth Doan on CBS is openly gay. You know, he came down with um, COVID-19. And I watch uh, CBS this morning because I used to be on the show. And it's my favorite network, or was. Uh, <laughs> they did, they did um, reports from with him from Italy, where he was based, from his apartment. And he would talk openly about his husband. You know, my husband this and my husband that, and I thought, wow, have we come a long way? You know, when I was, at, I, I was at CBS for 10 years from 1982 to 1992, and even that, I thought when I was going to Los Angeles that I would be on Easy Street, that there wouldn't be an issue anymore, but there was an issue. <laughs> and um, they said the same thing in the early 90s. You know, you can't, uh, you, can't, you can't do this, you can't do that. I remember I had a news director who said, um, you know, I understand you've been asked to be in the gay pride parade in West Hollywood, but we'd rather you didn't do that. Okay. And what year is this, roughly? Pardon? Oh, that was 92. 92. And uh, my partner at the time was the general manager of Conrad's in the Beverly Center. Very right. nice store. And yeah. after he told me that I couldn't uh, ride in the parade, or they'd rather I didn't, he, he said, Hey, if I send my wife to Conrad's, will your will your boyfriend show her around? And you know, it's like, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> One hand, the other hand, pot kettle. You know, you know it, it was. And ridiculous. I think to myself, if I'm thinking back correctly, and you, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I believe when you were dating Greg Luganis, who was also on this show. That was one of the first times that I had heard of somebody in entertainment, in a high profile position, going public with a partner who also happened to be in a high profile position in his own field. Um, I don't know about that. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I know it was uh, pretty unique and um, somebody had written into me or I had written into the advocate, as a matter of fact, after I was on the cover, Greg was on the cover, Somebody wrote in and said, you know, uh, I don't care which of them is the top or the bottom. All I know is I want the pick of the litter. <laughs> well, since you brought it up, no, I'm not asking. I can't ask 
those questions. But so I think, Pat, uh, Thomas, when you were with Patrick, it, it, the landscape must have been very different for you because by the time I heard about you, you and Patrick together in the mainstream press, it did not have the same impact for me as, say, 10 years earlier with Steve and Greg. Yeah, I mean, you know, we uh, got together in 2000. Uh, you know, at that time, I was still uh, closeted to professionally uh, and, and in, in my personal life in great regard. Uh, although there were people in my family that knew I was gay and I had a couple of gay friends, uh, but uh, I was working for an NBC affiliate um, when 9-11 happened. I was in Norfolk, Virginia at the NBC affiliate there as the five o'clock anchor and investigative reporter. And that's where I met Patrick uh, during my time there. And then my contract was up and you know, this is a point in my career where I was still trying to, you know, cut markets in half and, you know, uh, you know, make it as far as you can, uh, as quickly as you can. Uh, sure. And I got the offer from uh, CNN to move to Atlanta. Uh, and I came into that. Uh, they didn't ask me about uh, my personal life or personal questions. But uh, by that point, I was out in my own newsroom uh, back in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, and then when I came into CNN, uh, I didn't hide it, you know, but if I, I didn't bring it up either. So if I was asked, and I remember vividly, I, you know, I was put into an office. Um, we shared offices at, at this time when I came on board uh, to headline news. And Robin Mead was in uh, part of the office. Then Kathleen Kennedy, who was a longtime anchor, was there. And then and then me. And so the first day I met Kathleen, uh, she said, oh, well, I have some great people I can set you up with. I have this girl that I know. And I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm happily taken. And she's like, and what is her name? And I'm like, Patrick. And she said, oh, oh, okay. Uh, and, and that was that. You know, I, I figured uh, Kathleen and, you know, being in the newsroom, uh, that that'll take care of people coming up to me and asking about anything they'll all know. And then it pretty much took care of that. And you know, I introduced Patrick, you know, as my partner and the bosses all knew. And, um, you know, uh, there was no uh, there was no big deal about it, you know, mm. certainly in that that bubble uh, at that time. And so this would be uh, the early 2000s. Um, and I remember I, you'll you'll know the date, I'm sure around that time, People magazine had approached you and wanted to feature you in feature you in their most beautiful people issue and you were going to be like one of the most beautiful newscasters or single newscasters well it was and, eligible batch it was their eligible oh. bachelor edition all right and, but i'm calling you beautiful so all right well i wish they would have knocked on my door for that one they never well, came there's all right still so, time people there's still time it's uh, still beautiful we're all beautiful enough uh, but, but no it was for the eligible, eligible bachelor uh edition and i just and thought you, i don't want to do that yeah. And what, did that precipitate you coming out on a public level? I'm sorry, say again? Did that precipitate you coming out if, for, to the general public? Yes, yeah. Uh, so, you know, I just declined that. I just didn't feel that it would be honest to, you know, put myself out there like that when I'm, you know, I own a house. I've been in a, you know, relationship at that point, you know, for five years uh, with someone that I intended to be with for the rest of my life. I just thought that would be just kind of a silly trap uh, for myself. Uh, and I remember that. reading saying that it just felt dishonest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it just didn't feel, it, it didn't feel right with the person that I was trying to be, you know, and ramping up to be, uh, it didn't sit well. So I just said, no, you know, Steve, you, I remember one of the big things about you being on E was that you were at the at the time you were relatively young. You were in your thirties, I believe, weren't? You? No, I wasn't. No, oh God, you I wasn't. I, I well, let's see. I got to when I got to E, I was forty-one. Wow. Okay. Well, wow. you're next to that old woman. Yeah. Is that old? Oh, right. <laughs> Don't get me in trouble here, Billy. No, that's me. I'm. No, sitting next to me. 
Um, but well, the point well, I'm I getting the to, old lady on the set. <laughs> um, the point I'm getting to is that the two of you were at your peaks when people were really noticing very good looking, very young, very fit and non-threatening in a lot of ways. Did your, did your appearance help you in the career or do you think it was more your ability and just natural charm or is it everything? This is a question you can't answer because if I yes. say, oh, yes, I was so good looking that they I'll say me on, a, on the drop of a hat um, or I would the show. So what are you supposed to do? That you know, you sound like uh, very conceited. Be oh, uh, Steve. You are hot. You are, you are hot, but you're also talented. Uh, it may have helped to a degree, but I worked very hard to get there. I mean, I moved uh, five places in five years, five states in five years. Uh, got finally got to CBS in Los Angeles. I was there for ten years. Uh, and then, and then I, um, E came calling and, you know, eventually, uh, at first I didn't want to go to E because they were a cable network and sure. I, you know, I wanted, I wanted one of the, the three big O and O's. Uh, but then I were the, the news director, uh, in the E newsroom, uh, was somebody I had worked with at CBS. And he said to me, Steve, my two young sons don't know ABC from NBC from ABC. <laughs> All I know is what channel things are on. He said, "Come on," and and he, he turned out to be right. Um, and I uh, I really enjoyed my time at E. It was great fun. Thomas, it's kind of the same question to you. Did do you <laughs> believe? Do, do you believe that your looks helped you? I mean, your appearance. I don't even want to say looks, but your appearance did that help you? Or as some people have said on this show that it has actually hurt them because people wouldn't take them that very seriously. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's been a mix of, of kind of all those things, uh, you know, in, in this type of, uh, career trajectory, luck and timing has a lot to do with all of it, especially as Steve is saying, when you put in the hard work and you've made the sacrifices, uh, in your life, you know, where you devote yourself to this and you move around and you, and you try to position, position yourself, uh, to be where you need to be. Um, but yeah, I would say that, uh, you know, there, there's been a time recently where I think that someone didn't take me seriously because of my looks, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, there's nothing you can do about that. You know? Right. Uh, and you can try to, you know, outwork that situation or show your willingness to, you know, work around the clock or whatever. Uh, you can't you can't change that when somebody thinks that of you. You know, you you have an interesting background, and I, I don't really consider. I'm afraid it. where you're about to go. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not go. Well, I might be going someplace you don't uh, want to go. It's something you've been very open about. Is that you had a very strong Catholic background, very religious background, and you had an abusive situation that you've talked about very openly. And it seems to, and also a suicide attempt to try to deal with that. And it seems to me that those depths that you have come through have probably made you a much stronger person than somebody who hasn't. Not that I think that everyone should go out and find a terrible situation to survive, but has it, it has to have shaped who you became and your integrity. Uh, I, you know, I feel like it's, uh, you know, we're all given uh, certain things in our lives uh, that create wounds. And sometimes you just got to exit through the wound uh, to try to survive it and, and get past it. Or you can just kind of live you know, in that place, live in the wound. Um, and with the issue of, uh, you know, coming out as a, a sexual abuse survivor, um, you know, that was really difficult. Um, it's not something that I ever wanted to have to deal with. Uh, it was impacting me in later years with uh, my relationship with Patrick. Uh, and that's the whole reason why I wanted to confront it in the first place. Uh, and your parents. 
there was a big, uh, there was a lot that you felt shame and had to deal with with your parents, and I believe particularly with your mother. Well, it's be the 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 yeah the their divorce is what caused me. Uh, my parents uh, divorced, uh, started separating when I was in the seventh grade and divorced in the eighth grade. Uh, it just caused a lot of upheaval uh, at that time and was very upsetting. Uh, and my grades suffered because of it. Um, and I didn't get in and I was going to a Catholic lower school, uh, you know, first through eighth. Uh, I was, you know, the, the next thing you're supposed to do, you know, and is to go to the all boys school. Uh, and I didn't get in because my grades were bad. Uh, uh, the summer before my freshman year of, of high school, we had a chance encounter with the chaplain at that high school, that all boys school, who found out that I wasn't attending there, but that I did want to go there. And he intervened to help get me in. And my mother thought it was a miracle and uh, really saved the day. And so I ended up going to this school uh, and through freshman year, uh, you know, I was very thankful uh, to this priest. Uh, didn't have a, a super close relationship with them. And then uh, depression started kind of setting back in. Things at home uh, were not so good. In my sophomore year, my mother said, you know, I want you to get counseling with this priest. And so I started getting counseling. And that's when the abuse started. Uh, within a month of that, I was so low, I attempted to take my own life. And then my parents felt that I needed more counseling. And so they sent me back to that priest. And it was, you know, for me, a huge trap. I didn't know what to do. Uh, I didn't know how to solve it. And I didn't want my parents to ever think that it was their fault that this happened to me uh, because of their divorce and then sending me back uh, to see this person you know, after I attempted to take my own life, it was just like a vicious circle. There was, you know, I, I couldn't uh, see an exit door to solve it, uh, except to hide it. And then later in life, trying to unravel all of it, uh, that seemed really hard too, because I didn't want people to, uh, you know, think, which many people did because I ultimately I'm gay uh, that somehow that impacted me and made me gay or that I wanted that abuse. Uh, I mean, there were just so many weird things uh, that people threw at me after admitting that uh, and then also coming out as gay. Uh, you know, it was a, a lot to unpack and to try to do it in a way that was going to uh, leave me unburdened for the rest of my life because that had been a really heavy burden to carry for the you know, uh, two thirds of my life at that point. Uh, so it was tricky. It's, you know, it's funny. I had um, Anita Pointer on this show, you know, uh, a couple months ago, and she talked about within a very short period of time, losing her mother, her sister and her daughter. And that those things she can, and she had been a very religious person and she had been uh, the child of two pastors and she completely lost her faith and is if there is a god very angry at god for letting this happen and it may and actually she started crying when she spoke about it because she said i have no faith and that hurts yeah. when having come through this do you still have your faith um you know i it's your faith i i used to uh boy you know, I'm, I used to be really mad, really mad at God for a lot of things, um, because growing up, I uh, went to an all Catholic grade school and, you know, it was just it just felt it's all, it's all I knew. But I liked it, you know, and I liked going to church and I, I liked having a relationship with God uh, and I liked being able to um, feel something about faith. Um, when this all, you know, when that happened to me in high school, um, I, I don't think I thought much about faith then or letting it impact me in, in my relationship with God. Uh, it was later in life 
when I could really think about it, that uh, I, I was not going to let that, you know, that, that had already, that abuse had already robbed so much from me. I wasn't going to allow it to rob my faith from me too. Uh, so I had to work really hard at keeping that part of me whole uh, because that's something that I've always found uh, comfort in. And uh, while I'm not in church every Sunday, um, I still pray. I, I do still have a, a place in my heart with faith. Uh, and I, I have worked really hard at not allowing that person uh, to have robbed that from me. Um, Steve, I remember you had talked to me before about your relationship with your parents and coming out and particularly your father, yeah, that you, have, you would have a, um, a, a sort of don't ask, don't tell relationship. Yeah. And was that something that you felt kind of put a barrier between you and him? Were you able to be as close as you wanted to be? No, nope. That's why I'm, I'm very fortunate to have my brother. He's uh, 14 years older than me. And in many ways, he's been almost like uh, a parent. And he gives me the understanding and uh, um, the caring ear that I would have wanted from my father. Dad was so involved in his church. He was a Baptist minister. Yeah, say. And we used to joke, we called my mom the Virgin Alice. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they were very strict and you know, I loved them uh, and they loved me, but they didn't want to know anything uh, about my personal life, nothing. Versus Thomas, when you came out to your parents about everything, your relationship was very different. Certainly, at least with your mother, I know I read they've got, you were close. Yeah, yeah no, my mom, I, I, you know, uh, she's fantastic. And, and my dad uh, is also a great, it took him a minute, um, but uh, you know, I, I came out uh, before I ever told anyone about having been sexually abused. Um, and, I, and I wanted to make sure that there was a great delineation between that because I didn't want people to conflate, uh, you know, what me being gay and that, you know, that abuse having any relationship. A causal uh, relationship. Yeah. Um, so uh, I came out for my 27th birthday to my mother. Uh, I was working in Florida at the time and I flew home and I had a boyfriend. I had someone, you know, someone that I was seeing that I was very excited about. I had stopped dating girls uh, within that same year I was uh, being 26 years old. Uh, and I dated, dated girls up until that point. Good uh, treat. Yes, but now, but now I had a boyfriend, right? I was, I was trying right. to be, uh, you know, uh, honest with myself because that's what I wanted. I didn't, uh, I didn't want to date women. So uh, you weren't dating women to kind of fool other people. You were doing oh yeah. it really for yourself. Yeah. I mean, I would, uh, when I would come into a new town, you know, because of, uh, you know, moving around so much, I would always date a girl like right away, just so everyone in the newsroom could see that I was dating somebody and then we'd break up. And that way I could say, I'm too, I'm, I'm heartbroken over this, or I'm, I'm too, too fresh. Don't come at me with, you know, trying to hook me up with your cousin or somebody else. To, you know. And then, and then I'd be gone, you know, I'd get a new job. Uh, and I'd do that same trick over again. Um, did, did Steve, did you have anything like that in your experience? Did you date women as well? Did I? I got married. Oh, that's, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I can't remember everything. Did you do it? Did I'm you do that too. did you do it to send a message to other people or were you doing it for yourself? No, I no, I I think I did it because uh you know, I'm enough older than Thomas to you know and I see today that gay young men can more or less be themselves and not have to worry about it because yeah. you know and I and I, I envy them so. But I did it because gay people you know, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, we, we had to construct a double life, you mm -hmm. know, so as to not lose a job or or not be thought less than. Right. Um, and, I, you know, it's it's something that uh, I, I still struggle with, you know. I've paid a lot of shrink bills 
<laughs> talking about, you know, woe is me. Um, but it's, you know, you construct these, these, yeah, I remember talking to my sister once saying, I, you know, she knew I was gay. Uh, and I told her I was going to tell mom. And she said, why would you want to do that? You know, it's like, don't you think they'd want to know who I am? I, I would like them to know who I am. Yeah. Nuh -uh. I don't I don't know if I've told this story on the show, but I know I've told it to people in the past is that uh, one of the people I was closest to in my life was my my paternal grandmother. And um, I was her favorite. And, you know, she passed away, I guess, like I was 40 at the time. And at one point, maybe five years before she died, she asked, you know, you know, there haven't been any girls. You haven't met, introduced me to any girls. Are there any girlfriends? Do you like, or do you like boys? And I thought, oh, she's giving me the opening. And she said, do you like boys? Because if you do, it would kill me. And I said, no. okay, that is, do not tell me. She knows <laughs> on a certain, and I've learned, people can know on a certain level, but they, as Steve mentioned about his father, they don't want to know. They want to live in denial. And I think that is a failing of them. And I think it, at that point, I kind of realized that this is not my problem. Well, yeah, I think there's an expectation. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, as Steve was talking about, you know, about getting married. I think, you know, there's an expectation uh, that Steve was going to get married. It you was know, a lovely and, wedding, by the way. Say again? It was a lovely wedding. Oh, I'll bet. <laughs> My dad, <laughs> dad did the ceremony. But, but, you know, there's a, there's just this expectation that's, uh, you know, uh, put on us. Uh, and I mean us, you know, collectively as you're growing up, you know, gay or, or lesbian, uh, you know, everybody's got a predetermined idea of, of who and, and what you're going to be based on the fact that you've been unable to tell them the truth uh, right. because you're deathly afraid that they're not going to love you anymore. Uh, so you go along with that sham uh until you can't anymore um and i and, you know I, I was saying about my mom i was lucky enough um when i went home to come out uh and i was determined that it was going to be on my birthday and that this was going to be the gift to myself and we were at my mother's house and sitting at the kitchen table and i told her i needed to talk to her about something important and i and i just broke down crying it was so upsetting like just so upsetting to have to say these words out loud and to my, you know, to my mother and to her face. Uh, and she's like, honey, honey, it's, it's okay. Whatever it is, it's okay. Let me guess. Uh, <laughs> murdered somebody. And, and I'm like, no, it's no. It's troublesome that that was her first guess. Yeah. Well, she's, that's how upset I was. Yeah. And she's like, somebody's pregnant. And I said, no. And of she course. said, yeah. And she said, you're gay. And I said, yes. And she said, that's okay, honey. And I'm sorry you've had to carry this burden alone with you for so long. And she hugged me. And was relieved you hadn't killed somebody. Well, or gotten them pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, but I couldn't believe it. Like I was just blown away because that's all I ever, that's all I ever wanted. And yes, it was a burden, you know, to carry and to try to keep up, uh, with kind of all this, you know, all the lies and all the crap. And mm -hmm. uh, it just felt so good to be done with that. So and it's good. amazing that in one conversation, your life can change and that weight can be taken off of you. Yeah. It, it showed me that I could, you know, if I had, if I had my mom, right. Mm -hmm. I really didn't care about anything else. I mean, I could get there, you know, with, with that, with other family members, with other friends, but my mom was, you know, is the most important, you know, uh, that relationship to me then as it is now uh, is is really special. And she's been, you know, my greatest uh, cheerleader, my greatest supporter, uh, greatest ear, you know, when I need advice. Um, and and Patrick, you know, it's it's like they, they don't compare, you know, when you're putting your husband or your spouse up against, you know, a, a relationship like that with a with a parent. Um, and, uh, I feel very lucky, you know, very lucky that that's the type of reaction that I got because there are many kids that come up and they don't get that reaction. Uh, and, and that, that's just, that's heartbreaking to me. Uh, 
because I can't imagine not having a relationship, you know, with my with my family. I, you know, they're they're very important to me, uh, and so that's that's why I held it in for so long because I was just so afraid to lose that. Right. I think that you know people watching this today through today's eyes can see that there have been you know that that the same feelings regardless of when you were living are there you're holding on to this and it is able to get past it if you're able to just face it yeah i think uh you know having the courage enough to just tell one person uh gives you that strength to to keep going and that's really what it is it's it's just having one person to talk to uh and you don't need to you know then you know uh, quickly go and talk to other people you know you can just have that one person uh you know as your ear as your trusted someone uh but it can really make a big difference you know such a big difference you need an outlet mm -hmm. and it's nice to have that one human outlet yeah and usually they say i knew all along <laughs> well, that's true. and you know i will say for uh people today there are more options than I had, than any of us had. And one of the best organizations that I know of is the Trevor Project, which is mm -hmm. the nationwide suicide prevention hotline. And I'm putting up their website right there. Um, if anybody watching this, if you are a questioning person, if you have depression issues, if you have suicidal thoughts, or if you just need somebody to listen, they have trained professionals there and they're not judging you. They're not, they're not there to scold you. They're there to listen. And uh, I think everybody needs someone to listen to. And I think having had both of you as examples, and you know, I'm a little example. I'm not really a great example of anything, but I am a sort of a facilitator for people to see that you can't, it does get better. And I think that's mm -hmm. so trite to say sometimes because it's not like you wake up and magically, oh, it's better. I think what's more important is you get better because if you face it and if you live through it, your life does get better. And we have uh, three examples of us who have pretty good lives. I was gonna get a t-shirt that said, gay lives matter. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, these are these are times where phraseology really yeah. matters a lot too. And um, but it, um, you know, but role models really matter. You yeah, know, I uh, think visibility, not preaching, yeah. but just being there. I mean, the, but the, you know, Steve knows this. You know, for broadcasting and, and you know coming up in that in industry, uh, you know, with dreams of of you know hitting the big time and really doing something incredible with a, a career like that there weren't role models for us no. uh, you know to look at to think okay they've they've done it uh i can too and while you know you know me looking at steve you know whether it was on cbs or looking you know at e and thinking god i hope he is gay uh mm -hmm. you know he's 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 great at what he does uh he's super handsome i i hope he's gay i hope he's on our team <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you but we didn't, but, but there weren't the role models. Uh, and right. I, I think for kids nowadays, uh, there are, yes, more outlets, certainly organizations like the, the Trevor Project, which is uh, fantastic, but there are, you know, physical human beings that are uh, represented uh, in the media uh, that can be integrated uh, with their personal lives and their professional lives. Yeah, I think that when I uh, moved to, you know, when I started writing my column, which is now 25 years in August, um, beforehand, I had watched Steve the same way and said, well, maybe there is a place for me, you know, something that I could do. And interestingly enough, um, in the first couple of years of my column being syndicated, both on the web and in little local gay papers, some every once in a while, I get an email from somebody who said they stumbled on it, and they hadn't, and they felt they were gay, but they had never met a gay person, and just reading my column met them, let them think they weren't the only one. And I think seeing you guys on TV has done that exponentially for uh, generations of people, and uh, I have to thank you personally because you've both thanked, you've both helped me a great deal. Oh. Thank you, though. Thank you.
And, uh, you know, I think that's a nice place to kind of end it, that uh, we are in Pride Month. We're in changing times. Um, we have to take care of ourselves. We have to raise our voices. We have to wear masks when we can, socially distance when we can, but also be there for each other. Um, how are things where you are, Thomas? Uh, in terms of? You know, the, the the environment, people being out, people feeling like it's over or still being vigilant because I know every area is a little different. Uh, I, you know, I'm in Georgia. I'm in Atlanta. And so we were kind of, uh, you know, I think pretending like there was no pandemic all along. <laughs> uh, but uh, the majority of people are wearing masks. I know if I if I'm out to run errands or go do something, I'm wearing masks. I'm surprised when people aren't, um, you know, that always catches me uh, by surprise. Uh, but I think slowly but surely, uh, like I haven't gone back to the gym. I haven't, uh, you know, done stuff like that. I don't think I'm, I'm not just there yet. And I wasn't, a, I wasn't really going to movies much uh, before. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if I'm going to be going back to the movie theater anytime soon, but you can see life getting back uh, to just, you know, what if the new normal is here. Right. Steve, you and I talked yesterday and you were telling me that you still weren't really getting out a lot. No, not a lot. But, I, you know, I'm not really a social gad about anyway. Uh, I went to the gym today just a little while ago. And uh -huh. um, how was it? I mean, are, are people wearing masks? Or? There, there were very few people there. They're, yeah. Now they're only allowing uh, people who have a trainer to work. Oh, wow. And uh, I wore a mask. Everybody who who was there, there were probably five people in the place. Mm -hmm. uh, they all had masks on. You know, we have Mayor Lori Lightfoot and she mm -hmm. wagged her finger at us. If we don't, uh, you know, rules. we call her Aunt Lori. And uh, I, I will say She's that I, I had been nervous. Lesbian, oh, which is wonderful. Um, I um, had had the surgery and I had been very concerned about doing physical therapy because if you don't, you're not going to heal properly. Mm -hmm. And I you're all frozen. Yeah. I had a physical therapist that stayed open only for post-surgical patients. And still we're all wearing masks. We're all socially distancing. We're all, you know, using disinfectants and all that. So uh, it's hard to find, but um you just have to do what you are comfortable with and look out for other people because by not wearing a mask, what you're saying is I don't care about anyone else. And I hope that's not what they think. Um, anyway, I want to thank both of you. Thank you. This has been, oh God, the, oh my God, we're running so long. The time has flown and Thomas, I know you don't have a show today because you're not on my days, but Thomas Roberts, let us again remind people tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern, you are on with Kathy Griffin. Did yes. that obviously that's a pre-tape, so you're not completely live. Not completely live, no. <laughs> it's uh, been hard to kind of juggle everybody's schedules, and uh, I want to, you know, to try to make sure that I have a good guest every show. Uh, so sometimes you just got to pre-tape. You know? And if you have a role in more possibilities for technical issues. Yes, Which you know, is operator <laughs> error is is uh, a big issue with me. <laughs> so it's it's uh, it's good to have these things out of the way, and plus I got a new desktop application uh, that makes kind of you know self-producing the show uh, a lot easier than yeah. doing it the way that I was doing it, and I'm still you know just like staring in the camera doing nothing, uh, yep. and nothing's coming up. So. Uh, this has been a learning curve for everybody. Steve and I were talking about this yesterday. It's like you want to look at the person, but you want to look in the camera. And in a newsroom, very often they're together. So you're just looking in one thing. Right. Here, they, we're learning skills we didn't even know we needed. I know. and But I'm, uh, you know, I'm grateful for these apps uh, that have really, you know, saved my tail uh, with, with getting this far. So, you know, a little more, uh, you know, time's up at bat. I'll, I'll be getting better and better at it. And Steve, of course, you're in Chicago. Uh, you've now been with us a couple of times. I want to thank you because whenever I ask you for anything, you're there. And I really appreciate it. Hey, we have to help our own. 
You know, and we got to bring the world a little closer together. So uh, thank you both for being here. I will, we will talk soon. And uh, it was really interesting having um, the three of us together. So thank you. It was great. Time. Billy, thank, thank you very much. And Steve, it's great to finally meet you. Likewise, Thomas. Soon we'll do it in person, I hope. All right. <laughs> Take care, for Steve. Bye-bye, Thomas. Oh, sorry, I lost them both. Um, thank you guys for watching Billy Masters Live. Um, I just want to uh, close uh, remembering, um, as I mentioned earlier in the show, uh, I did have Anita Pointer on this show from the Fabulous Pointer Sisters. And one of the people we talked about was her sister, Bonnie, who I was very close with as well. Well, last week, uh, Bonnie... Pointer passed away in her sleep. And uh, here we are. We had performed at a diva simply singing, which is Cheryl Lee Ralph's benefit every year. Oh, geez, I hit the button twice. And um, just four months ago, I was with uh, all of the remaining Pointer sisters. That's Bonnie, Ruth, and Anita with me at the Hollywood Museum. We send our love uh, out to the Pointer family. I know this has got to be pretty hard on top of everything else you're going through. And uh, I just want to say that I love the Pointer sisters and I loved Bonnie. So uh, rest in peace. To everyone else, we will see you Thursday at 3 p.m. Don't forget to go to billymasters.com to get the latest gossip. And if you're at YouTube, press on that little button right there that says subscribe. And please subscribe. It helps us out a great deal. Uh, take care of yourselves. Be safe. And remember, if we're here, we're live. Unlike that Thomas Roberts.